Sixty years after the Nuremberg Trials, a conference commemorating the living legacy of Robert H. Jackson. There is nobody at the conference who knew Robert Jackson any better than Whitney R. Harris. Whitney Harris was born in Seattle, Washington on August 12, 1912. He attended the University of Washington, graduating with an A.B. degree, magna cum laude, in 1933. He attended law school at the University of California, graduating with a Juris Doctor degree in 1936. He practiced law in Los Angeles, entered the United States Navy as an ensign shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, served as a line officer, and remained in on inactive status until August 12, 1972. Toward the end of World War II, Whitney Harris was assigned by the Navy for special duty with the Office of Strategic Services. He was placed in charge of the investigation of war crimes in the European theater. In August 1945, Lieutenant Harris joined the staff of Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson in the trial of the major German war criminals in Nuremberg, Germany. He served as a prosecutor throughout the trial until October 1, 1946, and was primarily responsible for the prosecution of Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the Gestapo, and the SD. For his work at Nuremberg, he was awarded the Legion of Merit. He was there side by side with Justice Robert H. Jackson. Hi. I was invited to deliver the keynote address at a conference commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Nuremberg trial. Speaking in the same courtroom where we tried the major German war criminals before the International Military Tribunal 60 years ago, I characterized the Nazi era as a dreadful dream from which Germany had awakened. The trial had exposed the cynicism and evil of the actors in that dream and had shown to the world the righteous course humanity must take to prevent aggressive war, war crimes, and crimes against humanity in the years and centuries to come. The challenge of the 21st century is to ensure the preservation and enforceability of these profound principles of international law. The bronze plaques adorn the lintel above the doorway inside the entry to courtroom 600 where the trial took place. The center plaque represents human frailty in the offering by Eve of the apple to Adam. On one side is a Roman fasces for authority and on the other a kneeling figure holding a sword representing justice. In that courtroom, 60 years ago, justice vanquished authority. The genesis of the Nuremberg trial was a Moscow conference of October 1943, at the conclusion of which a statement was issued by President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Premier Joseph Stalin declaring the determination of the three powers to hold individuals responsible for crimes committed by them in the course of World War II. The statement warned that officers and men and members of the Nazi party who were responsible for or took a consenting part in atrocities, massacres, or executions would be punished by joint decision of the Allies. The statement concluded, most assuredly, the three Allied powers will pursue them to the uttermost ends of the earth and will deliver them to their accusers in order that justice may be done. Five months later, President Roosevelt further declared, in one of the blackest crimes in all of history, begun by the Nazis in the days of peace and multiplied by them a hundred times in time of war, the wholesale systematic murder of, of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. It is therefore fitting that we should again proclaim our determination that none who participate in these acts of savagery shall go unpunished. 1945, Nuremberg, Germany. The faint echo of goose steps hangs in air still heavy with the stench of the dead in the rubble. 
the Klieglet flags and massed stormtrooper banners are gone. The hoarse roar of cheering voices is stilled. The sea of ramrod arms raised in salute has evaporated. And in the wind is the howl of the dead for revenge. In the ruins of Berlin, much of the top Nazi leadership, fearing the rough and ready justice of the approaching Russians, would take refuge in death. Suicide has been the escape of Adolf Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, and the icy SS sadist Heinrich Himmler. But a few already dead monsters at the top would not be enough to satisfy what would be the judgment of the century. There was a, a strong sentiment um, at, at the end of the war when the Nazi depredations, the atrocities, were revealed to, to carry out drumhead justice, to put the Nazis up against the wall, shoot them. In the United States, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, Morgenthau, uh, felt that uh, this was the right procedure. In fact, uh, Morgenthau advocated that the entire Ruhr Valley be devastated and that Germany be reduced to a purely pastoral or agricultural state. Morgenthau was opposed in the <laughs> United States by Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson. Stimson believed that the German war criminal should be dealt with only by trial before an international military tribunal. Stimson's view was that to punish these men after a trial would stand better in history. Moreover, that this process would develop a record of Nazi criminality which would stand in history. Stimson's views ultimately prevailed in the United States. The laws of God and of man have been violated and the guilty must not go unpunished. On May 8, 19. 45, President Truman appointed Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson as the United States Chief of Counsel with the mission of bringing together the four major powers in developing a agreement for the trial of the major German war criminals. He also said that this must be a real trial, not a show trial, not a Stalin trial, but a trial which could result in acquitting a defendant if the evidence did not show guilt. There were hundreds of thousands of foot soldiers, let's say, of Nazism, who carried out the, uh, the mass executions, operated the gas chambers, shot the hostages, and so on. But what about the top leaders? How did you convict them? None of them. Uh, shot the bank guard, blew the safe, or drove the getaway car. Their hands were clean. There, there existed no international uh, court. There, inter there existed, at the time uh, they were preparing for the trial, no body of law. There existed no judges. There existed no courthouse. Uh, the, the instruments for trying uh, a drunk driver in any part of the United States were more complete than the instruments for trying mass murderers in Europe at the end of World War II. So they started from scratch. A lawyer in the War Department by the name of Murray Bernays was given the task of devising some kind of philosophy for this trial. Bernays came up with a brilliant idea, uh, which was the conspiracy theory, that the whole Nazi movement was just not simply a po legitimate political movement, but it was a criminal conspiracy designed to seize the territory of Germany's neighbors, to steal from these nations their wealth and their people, and to exterminate their Jews. And this conspiracy theory meant that by being a part of the Nazi leadership, you were part of a criminal conspiracy, and it was a net that held these people. It was agreed that three major types of crimes would be charged against these individuals. The first was the crime of waging aggressive war. The second was ordinary war crimes. And the third, crimes against humanity committed in the course of the war. The indictment would reach unprecedented size with the declaration that the whole Nazi apparatus of repression and aggression would be indicted as criminal as well including the Nazi party leadership, the high command, 
The Reich Cabinet, the Gestapo, the SS, with its hundreds of thousands of members, and the SA brown shirts whose roles numbered above four and a half million. With harsh irony, the city of Nuremberg, the mystic home place of Nazism, was picked as the trial's location. The courthouse was only a mile or so away from Nuremberg Stadium. Where Hitler and Goering and Hess had screamed their defiance of other countries. So it seemed fitting that it, a lot of it started there, and then it should end there. One of the few almost intact structures was the old Palace of Justice, an imposing building of great size with a commodious cell block and fine security. They took the adversary system of Anglo-Saxon justice used in England and in our country, which meant uh, having a prosecutor contesting a defense counsel. Then they borrowed from the continental system the idea that judges will receive the evidence and make the determination rather than a jury. So you had a hybrid continental and Anglo-Saxon court. Everything new, never tried before. Well, one of the major questions is who's going to be brought to trial? And the British had a list, the French had a list, the Russians had a list, we had a list. At times that list may have been as long as 100 people. A compromise was reached and 22 uh, prisoners were indicted. The uh, majority of the defendants were provided by the American side. Why? Because we held most of them. We had them in our POW cages. The Russians were a little bit miffed at this. From his opening statement and on throughout the proceedings, Justice Jackson's startling eloquence would burn the trial into history. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. The chief defendant stood accused of enough guilt to warrant 20 million murder trials. Even brought to bay, they exuded defiance. Hermann Wilhelm Goering, former Reich minister and number two to Hitler, would prove an unpleasant surprise for the prosecution. Confounding his image as a bloated, hedonistic clown, he would spring a steel trap mind and intimidating personal force to boldly rally the accused in a fight for their lives. Rudolf Hess, third highest in the original Nazi power bloc, sporadically mined madness. But the Russians had special reasons to want his blood. The slave laborers in the V2 plants, run by armaments minister Albert Speer, died at the rate of 108 per day. It is hard now to perceive in these miserable men as captives. Jackson's scathing tongue labeled the accused mercilessly. Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop was the salesman of deception. Party philosopher Alfred Rosenberg, Nazism's intellectual high priest. Walter Funk, the banker of gold teeth. Hitler youth leader Balde von Schirach, the poisoner of youth. Fritz Sockel, cruelest slaver since the pharaohs. He might have gone on. Seiss Inquart, hangman of Holland. Frank, Jew butcher of Krakow. Stryker, merchant of hate. Frick, perverter of law. Bormann, Fritsch, von Neurath, Schacht, Dönitz, and Rader conspirators of international murder. It would be what England's Lord Burkett would call a duel to the death between the representative of all that is worthwhile in civilization and the last surviving protagonist of all that is evil. I was not only the leader of the American prosecution staff, he was really the inspiration for this entire trial. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world 
imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating, that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. When we uncovered all these interesting documents which were so incriminating of the defendants, Justice Jackson made the statement that perhaps it could be mainly a, a documentation trial. Dead set against this was the colorful General William Donovan. He was head of the Cloak and Dagger OSS and a hugely decorated hero of two wars who had gathered much of the evidence. General Donovan felt the trial would not have a real impact unless there were live witnesses on the stand being interrogated, telling it like it was. He thought that was the way to capture public attention. Jackson would have his way, and the violently opposed Donovan would quit the trial, taking much needed talent and expertise with him. Germans were free to choose any lawyer they wanted, and they did, including unregenerate Nazis who might have belonged in the dock themselves. The defendants had, in effect, a guilt-edged defense. Any poor uh, defendant in an American court today would be lucky to have the quality of defense because some of these people were top lawyers in Germany. Some of them went on to fabulous careers in the years following the war. The primary defense of the German lawyers at Nuremberg on the question of aggressive war was that the charge was ex post facto. They argued that never before had any head of state been called upon uh, to answer the crime of waging aggressive war and that there was no juridical basis for this charge. Sir Hartley Shawcross replied, I suppose the first person ever charged with murder might have said, now see here, you can't do that. Murder hasn't been made a crime yet. The tribunal said, the very idea that states commit crimes is a fiction. Crimes are always committed by persons. Men who exercised great power cannot be allowed to shift their responsibility on the fictional state which cannot be produced for trial. The task of the prosecution was not to center the case upon the most lurid of the German atrocities and go for the patient, brilliant assembly of an airtight case built on the conspiracy. The greater goal was to convict the whole machinery of aggressive war on behalf of the humanity it had ravaged. In January 5, 1937, in a secret meeting with his top political and military leaders, Hitler had announced that it was his intention to solve the German space problem, that this could only be solved by force. And the only question was when and how. And from that secret meeting on, Hitler continued to plot his eventual assault upon Europe. Again and again, the eyewitnesses and documents brought Hitler's own damning words. It is my unalterable decision to squash Czechoslovakia by military action in the near future. It is the job of the political leaders to bring about the militarily and politically suitable moment. The world now looked in on a chilling series of top meetings with Hitler, von Papen, Goering, Frick, Keitel, Jodl, von Ribbentrop, and the rest. Where the Sudetenland Czechoslovakia and Austria were subjected to secret, merciless threats of military annihilation to make their fall to the Germans seem a desire from within. The prosecution traced back the carefully forged chain of criminal moves. The trumped up evidence of the Reichstag fire to create crisis. The orchestration against perceived enemies of the Reich, trade unions, the churches, Beginning with the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, Jackson dug into the campaign against the Jews, the legislation destroying their property and civil rights, 
their systematic exclusion from professional, cultural life and education, ending with vandalism, violence, and imprisonment on the way to calculated war and murder. Goering had summed it up. He said, I would hate to be a Jew in Germany today. Continuing to weave the net of a conspiracy against peace at the expense of the more sensational and easily grasped atrocities, Prosecutor Robert Jackson pressed doggedly through the aggressive war charges. One by one, he documented the incriminating secret maneuvers of Adolf Hitler, each aimed at naked aggression and provable by a trail of evidence. Documents under Hitler's signature read, no question of sparing Poland. We are left with the decision to attack Poland at the first suitable opportunity. He would say, I am only afraid that at the last moment some Schweinhund will make a proposal for mediation. The details that emerged were dry but unmistakable. How the men in the dock had cynically, murderously pushed an entire world toward devastation. The evidence showed that military destruction had not been enough for the Nazis. Plans in place set in motion a systematic annihilation of intelligentsia, nobility, and clergy. The Jews and Gypsies would have their own hideous attention, losing six million and five hundred thousand lives, respectively. Directives were found that invited the lynching of allied airmen without interference from the police. Other decrees ordered labor czar Fritz Sockel to deliver five million captive workers into slavery that was often a death sentence. A Nacht und Nebel, or night and fog order, had the promotion of pure terror at its roots. People disappeared forever without charge or trial. The conspiracy spiraled with attacks on Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, France, Greece, Yugoslavia, and Russia. Jackson pointed out that Germany never declared war under international rules, but struck always without warning and always against the sign assurances of treaties. Goering would later boast that the Nazis had considered your treaties just so much toilet paper. All this conspiratorial horror, wrung from dry paper, would come to light separately from the graphically presented terrors of the genocidal death camps. The prosecution would show a film called The Nazi Plan, based on early German propaganda films and meant to demonstrate that they had planned aggression from the first. Its effect on the defendants was electric and jocular. Chirac thrilled to his marching Hitler youth. Goering gleefully shouted the name of each plane and pilot he recognized. He whispered, even Justice Jackson will want to join the party now. Schacht, watching his war production glorified, asked, can you see anything wrong with that? An awed von Ribbentrop breathed, couldn't you just feel the force of the Fuhrer's personality? The mood of the defendants changed sharply when the film turned to the cruel and humiliating kangaroo court trial of those accused in the bomb plot against Hitler. As the Nazi prosecutor screeched abuse, the accused at Nuremberg soberly contrasted the vicious justice of the Third Reich with the even-handed tone of their own trial. Jackson, the brilliant rhetorician, was less skilled in the court remarks of cross-examination. His shortcomings were often shared by lesser prosecutors who became tangled in droning details. World interest waned. The fear of, of Justice Jackson was that the moral authority would just leak out of this trial as it dragged on and on and on. In the end, it lasted 11 months. He attempted to try to stifle the uh, amount of just sheer paper that the German defense could introduce. Jackson began to see the International Military Tribunal as foes arrayed against him. 
Especially vexing were his fellow American Francis Biddle and the Englishman Sir Jeffrey Lawrence. Lawrence wanted to rob the defendants of any capacity to claim that they weren't given a, a complete defense. Gehring has just testified uh, on his own behalf, and then he's being cross-examined by Justice Jackson. This is the dramatic high point, and everyone is waiting to see how the champion of justice and democracy deals with the, the champion of Nazi evil. I want to get what's necessary to run the kind of a system that you set up in Germany. Gehring has a leg up in this thing because Justice Lawrence keeps ruling that Gehring must be allowed to say as much as he wants to say. The usual rules of cross-examination are that, that the prosecutor is able to, to crowd the witness, to keep pushing him with relentless questions towards a trap and then spring the trap. But when Gehring could virtually deliver lectures on the political science of Nazi Germany, Jackson was never able to crowd him like that. Goering's two-and-a-half-day diatribe turned the court into a Nazi rally and made him the defendant's hero, like an athlete who had saved the game. Had Jackson made a mistake in not going directly after the most hideous and hateful of the crimes and criminals? Would his great hope for convictions on a cosmic scale allow the main case against war? to slip away into its own night and fog. Between the enormous scope of Robert Jackson's indictment, American technical miscues in prosecution, and the surprising fairness of the proceedings, the Nuremberg defendants began to believe that they might yet prevail. But now the tide turned with the shocking testimony of the Nazi butchers who had run the concentration camps and extermination squads. Their testimony jolted the world back to attention. Almost offhandedly, Gestapo officer Otto Ohlendorf made his admissions. And how many men, women, and children <clears throat> did you kill during that year? And he answered, 90,000. With that information, we were able to develop that <coughs> Contemporaneously with the German assault against Russia, four special action groups of the Gestapo and SD were sent into the occupied territories behind the German armies with, with the specific purpose of rounding up and killing all Jews and gypsies, intelligentsia that they could get their hands on. The estimate is that two million people were killed by these special action groups. Ferdinand Hirsch was the commandant of Auschwitz. Hirsch explained his mission in great detail and without any great emotion. He had been called to Berlin by Heinrich Himmler, and Himmler had explained to him that there was a secondary war involving the struggle between the Germans and the Jews, that if Germany did not deal with the Jews at this time. The Jews would certainly destroy Germany. And it was Hirsch's mission to establish at Auschwitz an extermination center. It is the most devastating confession of murder by any individual in the history of mankind. The prosecution introduced a film called Nazi Concentration Camps a compilation of death camp horrors which was assembled by America's noted film director, George Stevens. Many of these scenes were being shown to the world for the first time and produced unimaginable revulsion. Weeping broke out in the courtroom. Women fainted. And time after time, the words of the leaders and followers who had caused it all arose from written records to condemn them. Himmler had summed up the ethic. I did not feel justified in exterminating the men while allowing their children to grow up to avenge themselves. General Yodel said, if we had disobeyed, we would have been arrested, and rightly so. Hearst quoted his boss, Adolf Eichmann, as saying, he would leap laughing into the grave because the feeling that he had five million people on his conscience would be a source of extraordinary satisfaction. The prosecution now began systematically to demolish the wall of 
just following orders that the high command had tried to build around itself. Prosecutor Telford Taylor would say that men who commit crimes cannot plead as a defense that they committed them in uniform and that military men are not a race apart, men above and beyond the moral and legal requirements that apply to others incapable of exercising moral judgment on their own. It was pointed out to Keitel and Yodel that when Field Marshal Erwin Rommel had received the supposedly inviolable order to execute all commandos as captured, he had promptly and contemptuously burned it and to weigh judgment. In stark coincidence, on the day the prosecution concluded its case, Winston Churchill made his bombshell Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri, effectively launching the Cold War. Across the well, this is what the Nazi defendants had figured would happen all along, that at some point the West would wake up to the fact that the Germans were not their real enemies, that the communists were their real enemies. And when Churchill made that speech, that seemed to confirm all of their uh, convictions, and they really thought that at this point they could not uh, be convicted, they would not be uh, condemned, they would not be executed. Hess whispered to Goering, you will yet be Fuhrer of Germany. The whole process took oh, perhaps about a month, during which when the judges were in their chambers, they were going over the guilt or innocence of these people. And they did a very conscientious job. On October 1st, 1946, after 315 days of trial, the sentences were pronounced. Herman Wilhelm Goering. On the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Joachim von Ribbentrop, death by hanging. Fritz Sauko, death by hanging. Julius Streicher, death by hanging. Wilhelm Frick, death by hanging. Hans Frank, death by hanging. Alfred Rosenberg, death by hanging. Wilhelm Keitel, death by hanging. Ernst Schausenbrunner, death by hanging. Also sentenced to death were Jodl, Seiss Inquart, and Martin Bormann, who was tried in absentia. Hess, Funk, and Rader got life prison terms. Speer, von Schirach, von Neurath, and Dirnitz got long sentences. Fritsch, von Papen, and Schacht went free. All indicted organizations except the SA were convicted, as were the general staff and high command and the Reich cabinet. Interestingly, the, um, the defendants at the end of the trial, while they railed at the jurisdiction of the court, that the court had no right to try them, most of them were very grateful and expressed their gratitude uh, for the defense they had uh, received the latitude of defense that their counsels were granted. The defendants' reactions ranged from cringing to venomous. Fritsch muttered that he was drowning in filth. Frank said, a thousand years will pass and Germany's guilt will not have been erased. But Goering thought that 50 years from now there will be statues of me all over Germany. Although his absence from Washington had cost Robert Jackson his dream of becoming Chief Justice of the United States, he called his time at Nuremberg the most important and enduring work of my life. It stands firmly against the resignation of man to the inhumanity of man. This brings us to the point that the really the most important thing that was achieved at Nuremberg was not the conviction of these men, and not the sentences imposed, but the determination for history that waging aggressive war is a crime. The United States Navy throughout the war. Toward the end of the war, I was uh, transferred to the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, and placed in charge of the investigation of war crimes in the European theater. And I was engaged in this assignment when representatives of the Allied powers met in London for the purpose of drafting an agreement for the trial of the top leaders of Nazi Germany. 
I was invited to join the American prosecution staff and was in the first group of prosecutors to go to the site of the trial, Nuremberg, Germany, in August 1945. As Greg said, I was assigned the case against the Gestapo and SD and Ernst Kaltenberg, the chief of the Reich, uh, main security officer, RSHA, and presented in court the first case against any individual defendant. It was in the course of these duties that I helped uncover the dreadful facts which we now call the Holocaust. This was the work of the Einsatzkommandos, to follow the German armies as they advanced on the Eastern Front, seizing Jews from their homes and taking them and other Nazi undesirables into the fields to be murdered. But as the war progressed, the Nazis found need for permanent installations to house, exploit for labor, and ultimately to murder uh, these victims of Nazi insanity. Concentration camps already existed to imprison perceived enemies of the state. Now something more formidable was required, extermination centers to eradicate the unwanted who had not been killed in the fields. The extermination camps were Treblinka, Sobibor, Meidenach, Chelmo, Belzec, and Auschwitz. Of them all, Auschwitz murdered the most. Many innocents died at Auschwitz. Was it four million, as the Russians claim, or three million, as was testified in Warsaw, or two, as Hearst told me, does it matter? A mother weeps equally for the loss of each child as we weep for the Auschwitz victims of the Hitler Holocaust. A thousand years have passed. What was the number killed at Auschwitz? It matters not. It was but a trifle in the history of the massacre of man by man. This world in which we live is subject to the overwhelming fact of force. Nature speaks to us in that idiom. The hurricane that rises from the sea and spreads havoc on the land, the earthquake that shatters the stillness of the day and brings buildings tumbling to the ground, the erupting volcano that sends boiling lava over green fields and quiet homes are forces which nature may unleash in angry mood. Against these forces, mortals have yet to prove their greater power. No one has shown the way to still the voice of the mighty hurricane or quell the mysterious shifts of underlying mountains, or stop the red lava in its flow to the sea. And yet, these forces of destruction do not possess the power to destroy humankind, which human beings themselves have devised. The atomic age burst in fury upon the world. We are caught in the peril of that age. Man-made forces can now destroy man. Perhaps civilization is in its decline and barbarism its due. That will depend upon whether force or law triumphs in tomorrow's world. Thank you.